Ed Pinkston, can you give an opening prayer? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Our Father in heaven, we humbly bow before thee, thanking thee for all the many blessings. We thank thee for this day that has granted us. We especially now thank you that we're able to have a Baba class that we can study your word that we might learn what you have for mankind upon this earth. We long for the day you send your son to this earth to establish the kingdom. And we pray that be your will, we might receive a portion therein, that we will be able to serve and dwell with you forevermore. And also we send a prayer for Gerald Sankey that he will recover and be back with us as soon. We ask all these things to thy son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. So to recap a little bit from last week, because I know we're, we, we don't have an overlap of everybody. Um, we covered Laodicea, which is the lukewarm church. It basically goes from either the 1750s or 1850s right up until the time Christ comes back. So we're at the end of this epoch. Um, Philadelphia was the best one. There was no condemnation, nothing but praise for Philadelphia and what they did. Um, the opposite is true of, of what happens with Laodicea. So it says, write a letter unto the church of the Laodiceans, the amen, the faithful and true witness. The originator of God's creation says, I know your works, that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish that you were either hot or cold. So because you were lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I am going to vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and need nothing, and you don't know that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. So here's where his advice comes into play. He's like, these are your real conditions. You think you're this, but here's what you really need to do. So he advises them to buy gold refined in the fire so that we may be rich and clothed in white and you may be dressed um, and your shameful na nakedness will not be exposed. So he wants them to buy gold. And that means being refined by fire through trials and also to be covered with um, this white blameless covering, which is obviously Christ as many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be committed and repent. Listen, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and have dinner with him. And he with me, the victor, I will give the right to sit, um, with me on my throne. So just as I won the victory and sat down with my father on his throne, anyone who has an ear should listen to what the spirit says to the churches. What other points do you all remember from last week we talked about with Laodicea? Test question. I'm sorry? Test question. <laughs> yes, test questions. We're there. We're there. We're there. I'm sorry? Aren't we there? Are we like doing one of this um, Laodicea type stuff? I I'm sorry, I'm lost. You're what? Aren't we in the period of time? Oh, yes, we are. I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about in the class. I was trying to figure it out. Okay, yeah, this is where we are. It's talking about us today. Um, well, we talked about um, that um, we needed to be taking more risks for Christ as far as preaching goes. Um, that was your point. That's how gold is tried in the fire uh, because you do set yourself up for, for persecution when you are um, telling people about the gospel. Yeah. And if you're not telling people about the gospel, then you know you can live a real comfortable life, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, you, know, you know, for the most part, I mean, you know, nobody will give you any problems. You know, you're kind of, kind of become like the false prophet who everybody spoke, spoke well of, right? Yeah. So pers that's one way that people can be persecuted, but they can just be persecuted for living the life of Christ in their daily life. Um, and that was another way that it can be done. So that what's really interesting too is that this city was destroyed by a massive earthquake in AD 64 and leveled it. And you can see this is like an aerial view of the town. And we know in the last days, the same thing is gonna happen. Where's one in there to see it? Yeah. It's in Turkey. Okay. Um, we, we showed it right at the beginning. I'll show you real quick. These are the, the churches. So it's in Anatolia. 
Um, it's right next to the Aegean Sea, right before you get to Istanbul. So we did Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and this is, we're finishing up Laodicea. I'm just recapping from last week. Um, the city did not heed the Lord's warning, and its beautiful and exotic things were buried in the ruin of a great earthquake. Um, they're actually rebuilding the amphitheater there, which I think is really interesting. So the Laodicean church is the last of the seven to receive admonitions from the Lord Jesus, and as such represents the final era of the church from 1850 to the crowning of Christ. Um, so it is derelict in the godliness that the very head of the church is to stand outside and knock, trying to make himself heard that he might enter in. Um, and so this is the problem with where we are today. Um, because our, our period takes us up to this date. And it will be destroyed by an earthquake as well. Um, how well this describes the churches of the latter days who have turned their ears away from the truth and entertain devils, demons, and um, evil spirits, imaginary false angels, and trinities of pagan gods. They retain the form of godliness, but deny the power thereof. <laughs> as the Apostle Paul described uh, the state of many of the latter days just before Christ returns. So, Joanna, can I get you to read the Second Timothy passage down here? In Second Timothy 3.13, he points out that evil men and spiritual seducers shall wax worse and deceiving and being deceived. Then as now they thought they were rich in this world's goods and in the knowledge of the Lord, but instead were lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Yep. And last week, Johnny and Amanda had read another passage that talked about how bad things were going to get. So, Johnny, I was curious if you could read Jude. It's just one chapter, just a few yeah. verses. <laughs> <laughs> so I, th I thought you would enjoy this because He's warning them, this is what's going to happen in the latter days. And he says, these people are twice dead. They're a storm without rain. They're, it's just amazing how he puts it. So start after verse 9. I think it's verse 10 to the end. Should be good. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, eight, eight or nine. I mean, I guess eight doesn't matter, right? Um Similarly, these dreamers nevertheless also defy their flesh, scorn lordship, and revile glorious beings. Yet the archangel Michael, even when he argued with the devil in a dispute over the body of Moses, did not venture to pronounce a reviling judgment upon him, but said, may the Lord rebuke you. But these people revile what they do not understand and are destroyed by what they know by nature like irrational animals woe to them they followed the way of cain abandoning themselves to balaam's error for the sake of gain and perished in in the rebellion of korah <clears throat> these are blemishes of your love feasts as they carouse fearlessly and look after themselves they are waterless clouds blown about by winds fruitless trees in late autumn twice dead and uprooted they are like wild waves of the sea foaming up their shameless deeds, wandering stars for whom the gloom of darkness has been reserved forever. <clears throat> so, Johnny, where are these people? Sorry? In the world, where are these people that he's talking about? Are they in the ecclesia or the church or are they in the world? These are people that are supposedly pretending that they're in the church. Exactly. Yeah. So that's the big warning is that they're they're living a totally hypocritical lifestyle and their damage is to everybody else. They're like gangrene. And he compares them with Korah. You know, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram were swallowed by the earth because of their greed trying to take over Moses' position. So we know from that they're going to try to take over the Ecclesia. He also says Cain. Why Cain? Because he's um, his brother, right? Yeah, and it, yeah, I wasn't sure if you made the point that it's like the last week that it says that his, it might have been a different one, but that his blood cried from the earth too, you know, yep. so <laughs> just to add that, sorry. I know it's not, that's great, because the thing is that they're trying to slay their brothers and sisters spiritually, and it says, you know, fear not man and what he can do to you, 
but he says you can fear this person. What, what caveat does it give when it talks about that? It says you can fear this person. And the man who can destroy the soul and the body. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I thought you meant in the right here. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, not in June. It is not. It's not in June. I was making an allusion <laughs> to the other one. But anyway, the one you brought. What was the one you brought up again last week, Johnny? Uh, huh? What we were doing. I think it was from Second Peter. Yeah. Yeah, in Second Peter, it was. Uh, hold on one second. I mean, John also says it too in a different way. So I was just thinking maybe it was that. I think it was Second Peter. Oh, about false teachers, fall, chapter. Wait, hold on. It was either in three or four. I can't remember. Uh, oh, false teachers, but uh, denounce. I think right. Uh, there were also yes. false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will introduce destructive teachings and even deny the master who ransomed them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. And many, it says many will follow their licentious ways and because of them, the way of truth will be reviled. And in their greed, they will exploit you with fabrications, but from before, t uh, from very long ago, their condemnation has been waiting for them and their destruction is not sleeping or does not sleep, it says. <clears throat> So it's warning all of modern day Christianity in the Laodicean period, how they're going to be taken away. What are the characteristics of the leaders who will take them away? Give me some examples that we know over the last 50 years are examples of this. It's like big, salient, well-remembered. <laughs> Billy Graham. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wasn't going to go that 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 place but i mean he's one of them i guess i i just was thinking more along the lines of like jonestown oh yeah, 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 true. horrible that was or Wait, what waco texas and what happened with it. i can't remember his name david koresh and jim, jones. and jim jones was the other guy and they just twisted and twisted and twisted god's word to mean whatever they wanted to mean and their flock were not like the bereans they didn't check scripture to see if what they were saying was correct or not so we can't really relax in this era of the Laodicean period. We have to be like the Bereans. We have to check it and make sure if what people are saying is true. Um, and it's not to, if somebody makes a mistake when they're speaking, it's not to like go take them and tar and feather them and lead them through the streets. It's just to go to them quietly and say, did you mean to say this? Because this is the way it came across. Do it gently, but at the same time, don't be carried away. So all these passages from Jude, from Second Peter three and four, from you said John was the other one, um, Johnny. Yeah, I think that John says it in like uh, one second. It's kind of, I think it is. I'm trying to remember exactly where he goes. Oh, so he talks about Antichrist. Yeah. It's, it's the last days, just as you heard that the end that. Antichrist will come. So now many antichrists have appeared. Thus we know that it is the last time. For they went out from us, but they're not really of our numbers. For if they were, they would not. They would have remained with us. But their desertion shows that none of them was of our number. But you have, but well, you have the anointing that comes from the Holy One, and you all have uh, the knowledge or knowledge. Um, I write you because you do not know the truth, but because you do, and because every lie is, is not of the truth. Who is the liar, but he who denies Christ Jesus? Whoever denies the Father and the Son, this is an antichrist. No one who denies the Son has the Father, but whoever confesses the Son has the Father as well. I mean... That's great. That's, how I so that's, very, that's very useful. There's... You know, the other one that talks about what to expect and says they're going to, you know, hate their parents. They'll be slanderers. They won't have any self-control. I think you read that one last week. Oh, yeah. That so was these, Timothy. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that was very good. Um, hey, Jeff. Yes. Um, so, so, you know, this makes me think about, like, in this Laodicean period, 
I'm doing this because I can't hear you. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, so what I think about is never has there been an easier time to be a fake no. Christian. Yeah. I mean, because really, you can go to church every Sunday, you can profess it, but we're not really persecuted for being, quote unquote, Christians in our society. No. So it's very easy to be an insincere Christian. And I think that's what the Laodicean, the whole thing is about, really, is just they they love riches more than they love serving God, you know, and we have an affluent country we live in and, and people are able to. Even the poorest people in our country have, you know, a television, internet, cell phones, cell phones and yeah. air conditioning, you know. <laughs> yep. So um, I think it's it's very easy to be an insincere Christian in our world. And to build on what you said, also during COVID, it has been even easier because nobody sees you at all. You know, nobody even knows if you're there or not. Yeah. Um, and I say that because... I, I did that little study where I went to a couple other churches to find out what's going on. I tried to go to the Methodist church on a Sunday. They're all shut down. Mm-hmm. They still haven't reopened. Some of the congregation was so mad that the leadership decided to do this. They were meeting in the graveyard. Right. <laughs> wow. I'm wow. not joking. This is like unbelievable. And, and so many people have not gone back. And what is this building towards? It's building towards the complete erosion of Christianity right before Christ returns, you know? So that's why the Gentile age is going to be kind of spent. Um, And this erosion just keeps coming because there's nobody teaching and feeding the flock. What has Sunday service become in mainstream megachurches? Hey, Joe. Yes. Another thing, and and I've heard several people say this to me, and these are people, you know, outside of of our faith say to me that their churches, um, like everyone in the church, are older people. They don't have any young people. They don't have any children in their churches. I had a lady tell me this week, one of my patients was telling me, you know, their congregation was still meeting. But she said all of them are older people. There's not a single child in their church. Yep. And they're not the only ones. The it's a it's a dying out situation. And that's why I think it says the generation that saw all these things, which was Jerusalem becoming a nation and coming into being in 1948, will not completely die off before all things are fulfilled. So we're waiting for that to happen. Um and we, we hope and pray that that's going to happen. I mean, I, I grew up with lots of dates in my head. People said 1988, Christ was going to return. Then 1992, then 2000, then several other dates. But, and now people have just given up, I guess, and stopped predicting, um, which I don't think, you know, we, we constantly need to be looking and watching. But there's a hubris in thinking you've nailed the date down. Um, yeah. So I, I, go ahead. Go ahead, There's also, I mean, even pre-COVID, there's a really interesting um, Freakonomics episode that I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that, but it's, they just take economics and they apply it to everyday things. Yeah. Yeah. And they, they talk about how people don't go to church anymore because they can just automatically put their payments in. And then they just think that okay, I'm good. I don't, that's, I'm set. I don't need to do anything else. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that one. Yeah. I have the book for Freakonomics. It is very interesting. Yeah. They have like a little podcast and there's an episode about that. It's, it's very, it's a very interesting episode. And if I might add another thing too, about the, the, since I grew up uh, going to Catholic school too, and like, I just know they've done a lot of uh, reports on the news, actually, where they're like Catholic church attendance, even in Europe, is just going boom, like straight down. Even attendance in like the Catholic church is going down a lot, which I mean, obviously, it's not a bad thing, sort of, but <laughs> like it's just really interesting that usually, you know, they're so ritualistic that, you know, they're like, um, and they've always been able to adapt so well, you know, throughout the ages that. That's a really big sign for me, I think, you know, like, 
it's like whoa <laughs> you know like you, it's it's crazy they've been able to you know ground people for a long time i um sorry that's all <laughs> but here's another thing to, to take into considerations um when people are in power they want certain conditions to be in place to stay in power okay what did caesar say about fat men <laughs> he, said, he said let me be surrounded by fat men why because he knew they were satisfied they weren't going to rock the you know fruit cart they weren't going to cause unrest they weren't going to shake the earth they were fat and sassy. So he was happy about that. And he's like, it's when the times get dire and things get really rough that the populace rises up, like October 1917 in Asia. Does anybody remember what happened there? October 1917, Asia. Oh, yes, good. it is, you little monster. It caused the end of the Russian Empire, 300 years of Russian rule. Yeah, so the people were so desperate, they had no food, no no nothing. The churches weren't allowed anything, that they literally destroyed the czar, which was the last of the three frogs kind of idea that this, this empire was completely thrown out. Um, and that forced basically communism to just dispel religion altogether. And now you've got a whole generation, two or three generations that have been without God this whole time. And this was after all the pogroms against the Jews. So that series of desperations caused the, the, the revolution to happen. So there isn't going to be one during the Laodicean period because everybody's so wealthy and comfortable. And that's why the seriousness of serving the Lord isn't there. They've got lots of distractions. Um, and I'm showing you this because this is another one of the distractions in the town of Laodicea. This is the bath for the town. You can see, you're just looking at a ruin here and above, you're seeing a reconstructed um, 3D model of what it would have looked like. Um, we covered this last week. Why did the Lord Jesus counsel the Laodiceans to buy white raiment and to anoint their eyes? This the simple answer is that then, as now, their garments of faith was stained with the traditions of men. They had become blind to the righteousness of true faith. The white linen of the servants and the Lord has been replaced by the scarlet and purple vestments of the church, and leading uh, leaders of which have unfortunately teached another, a gospel of another God. So it happens as a cycle in all humanity, like cycles of civilization. They start off with a very strict moral code, then they get wealthier, then the morale drops. Finally, they get complacent and rich, and then they're taken over by another country. It happened to Babylon. It happened to Media Persia. It happened to Greece. It happened to Rome. And it happened, you know, ever since then, empires have risen and fell because they've completed the cycle. So the same thing happens to religion. In this case, religion starts off with a true doctrine and then they start adding all these traditions onto it. They move away from a moral compass. And then when they become rich, it becomes lax. And then it just kind of implodes. Um, so that's what's happening in this situation as well. The real truth isn't being spoken. It isn't being taught. Instead, it's been supplanted by man's tradition. So Christ picked this up from Isaiah 29, 13. He says, a terrible thing has happened. To, well, sorry, that's a different one. That's from Jeremiah. A terrible thing has happened to my people. Good has become evil and evil has become good. But they said um, in 29, 13, for their religion of me is made up of only rules taught by men. Christ quotes it in the New Testament. That's what happened to the Pharisees and Sadducees. That's what happened to the religious leaders. They took God's law, completely masked it so they couldn't see it anymore and replaced it all with their own traditions. Jeroboam, um, son of Nebat, did the exact same thing. When he took his ten tribes away from the rest, from, from Rehoboam, he set up what? In Dan and Bethel. <coughs> right. And he did what with the priest? He had to cover that one, too. 
He said, any of you can be priests. Anyone can serve. You know, that's not restricted. So we would say, oh, that's good. That's inclusive. <laughs> that's democratic. God's not looking for that. He has specific people do specific jobs. So in, in that case also, what did he do with the high holy days that were existing? The Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Booze, the Day of Atonement. What did he do? With God? Uh, Jeroboam said he bad. He deliberately blocked them. He made new holidays to cover over those so they wouldn't go to Jerusalem and they wouldn't serve. So that's exactly what's happened during the Laodicean period. The real truth of the Lord has been replaced by other things, and that's the danger. Um, Lee, you want to read this one? Okay. The Reformation, and thus, thus freedom from the bonds of the Roman terror and ignorance of centuries, brought a, a brief flurry of truth. But gradually, this new feeling of euphoria subsided, and the new freedom was gradually exchanged for the very same pagan bonds of serious worship of many gods and the fear of disembodied spirits, which had been foisted onto those who had not put forth the tiniest spark of inquiry into the wonders of the true God. So, what are we seeing today that people have re have brought back from eons ago? What are the Wiccans doing? Like, like yeah, I mean, they they believe in in the earth and mother the, the mother earth God and all this other stuff that has gone right back to the pagan era when all this ignorance began. Um, anybody else have an example of what we're seeing? Okay. Well, I mean, you hear a lot of people say um, the universe instead of God. You know, right. Like, you know, I'll, I'll put it out into the universe, and, you know, hope, hopefully the universe will bring back a blessing or something like that, you know. Like, it's not a personal father, you know, right. who made the world. It's just kind of everything coming together by chance and all of it in our favor. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know? So the point of the Reformation was is to differentiate yourself from Catholicism and what they were doing. They were having papal in, indulgences. They were selling all these relics and acting like this is a splinter that came from the cross. This is a tear that came from Saint so and so, you know, and getting them to buy them and all the other pieces that were wrong. So they had a big reformation. It was a huge difference between one and the other. Then gradually, all the reformed churches, what happened to them? Yeah, Over the last 200 back years. To, uh, to the mother church. And then Dr. Dale started losing their doctrines, um, you know, making uh, concessions and compromises and, and uh, kind of blurring the lines. And, and now their statements of faith don't even resemble what they used to do. They're exactly right. So that's the real, the real danger. And that's why the Reformation is lost today except for a small pocket um so let me get patsy good luck did i get you to read yet okay okay thank you the new churches established their own priesthoods which grow which grew rich in their diplomas of doc and doctors of divinity well trained in philosophy and modernism and in funding fundraising and bringing in multitudes of members but poorly trained in the simple truths of the scriptures which became buried under the adopted teachings of Rome no wonder the lord jesus advises his advises this laodicean church of the latter days to anoint thine eyes that thou mayest see the Lord Jesus could see ahead 2,000 years and saw a continuing state of blindness in each in blindness in the end time church, exact, exactly as had happened in the early church of Laodicea, where the teachings of the apostles were abandoned for the apostolic teachings of men who invaded the church. So... Searching for the truth is not easy, and this is the, the point I would like to make. It only takes one generation to lose God's truth, one. And then it can take 10, 20, 30 generations to get it back. 
Because once you're in that ignorance, blindly trying to find the door to salvation is very difficult. So you have to really have it in your heart to want to find it. And I think that's what Johnny last week was so impressive about your story is, you know, how do you find it on your own in the world um, when everybody is not even interested in it? You know, they, they're not, there's not a lot of resources to go to. So um, it's pretty powerful. Amanda, can you read this one? The Lord Jesus pleaded with the Laodiceans at both ages to be clothed with white remnant that the shame of their nakedness their desperate lack of the knowledge of his salvation might not be apparent, indeed might be covered. His love for his children of faith shows then in his assurance that as many as I love, I, re I rebuke, admonish, and convince, and chast chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. His word repent reveals a sorry state of affairs in the apostate church for it reveals a state of wickedness which had overtaken his servants yet in this age as in the apost apostolic age the father is rebuking and chast chastening a remnant which is remaining faithful to the high calling to which they are called so we know that he's course correcting us as we're going we're navigating towards the kingdom but sometimes our ship is blown off course and he's redirecting it and blowing the winds back another way so that we'll stay on the course and we won't lose our way. Um, but that's, I think, if we're, we're honestly praying for it and asking for it from the Lord. So um, let's see, who haven't I asked to read? Joanna, have you read tonight? I have. Okay. Oh, Joe, is, he there? is Joe there? Would you like to read? No, he's he's he can't read at the moment. Okay. How about Nora and um, where are they? Are yeah, they still I up? I can read Nora, would you like to read it? No, I'll let Karen. Sorry, Karen. I'll read it for her. Uh, one section of the church is to be spawed out of the Ooh. discord discord discarded sorry well it's the few who overcome not only the sinfulness of human weakness but also the up say leading uh, many to the eternal death will be uh, granted to fit with the lord jesus in his throne which will be the restored throne of david when the word of the lord shall go forth from jerusalem Micah 4, 2, which the vision recorded in Re Revelation 6 to 19 are detailed uh, prophecies concerning the Christian church in its uh, spiritual and political uh, relation relations with the nations during the church age. It is the obvious uh, that the Lord Jesus provided us with a summary or synopsis of the same history it is letters to the seven churches so there's a all this is to wrap it up that all these different lessons are learned so um i was trying to help us remember the different ones so for like smyrna plus persecuted and the 10 different um edicts by the emperors against christianity plus the synagogue of satan and 10 years of persecution equaled if they resisted, um, you will receive the crown of life. So it's to try to make us, I give us little pictographs to try to help us figure these things out. Um, so Ephesus was uh, the loveless ecclesia. They hated the work of the Nicolaitans. What's the next symbol? The and then plus what? What is the they one? The exactly. And then? They were protected Very good. See, it's, the pictograph works. <laughs> we did that one. Here's Pergamum. So, who wants to do this one? Let's see. Uh, okay, again? Okay, go ahead. So, in Pergamum, he has Satan's throne. 
Um, but even though they lived, you know, where Satan's throne was, they were to never deny their faith. Um, I believe it also talked about, didn't it talk about Antichrist and the faithful witness? There. I think yeah. so, but it mainly was the, the the there were those who held to the to the Balaam's teaching mm -hmm. and to the beliefs of the Nicolaitans, and they were supposed to get rid of that. And then it leads to the final conclusion, which is they would receive the white stone. Is that the hidden manna? It's all three. Hidden manna, okay. white stone, and a new name. All three. Um, so we'll, I'm going to go from here, as so I'm going to go back up really quick to the 10 persecutions against the church that was from Smyrna and we'll finish those this week and next week let me see get back to it in time oh my goodness wow <laughs> okay Okay, so these are the, and we're not going to do all of them tonight. We're just going to do a couple of them. But in with the Smyrna church, it was the period, the Christian ethic from 64 AD to 313 AD. And it was a period of tremendous persecution against Christianity in general. That's why it's such a good representative of the Christian history. So from Nero to Diocletian, this whole um, 250 year period was marked by terrible um, <sighs> persecutions and also martyrdoms that went on and on and on. So um, you got Nero from 64 to 67, Domitian from 81 to 96, Trajan from 98 to 117, uh, Hadrian from 117 to 138, Marcus Aurelius from 161 to 180, um, Septimus Servius from um, 193 to 211, Maximus the Thatrian um, from 235 to 236, Decius and then uh, Valerian and then Diocletian. So that these 10 emperors had 10 different things that they did against Christianity um during their lifetime so um can either of the pinksons read this or is it not possible i can't see anybody we prefer somebody else to read it okay um johnny would you like to try to read it on the left hand side yeah <clears throat> from the what we're at the, at the very beginning, right? The blue part, yeah, yeah. on the left hand side. The, the second problem faced by the Christians of Asia Minor was emperor worship. It is common to hear a lot of talk about the persecutions of the early Christians, but the term is not used in the apocalypse or in Revelation. Uh, instead, we find the terms trial, Revelation 3.16, and suffer, Revelation 2.10, and tribulation. Revelation 1, 9, 2, 9, 10, 22, 7, 14. Um, the term tribulation implies pressure brought upon the Christian. We may think of this as persecution, but let us not get hung up on that particular term. In my tour notebooks uh, for this area, I have included a chart showing the 10 major persecutions under the Roman Empire typically listed in works of the church history. Here below is that simple list. Nero's persecution seems to have been limited to Rome. By the time we reach Diocletian, we see a more widespread situation. In AD 305, <clears throat> Diocletian ordered that all church buildings be burned along with all books and Bibles of those churches. So they were trying to keep Christianity from spreading, but the more they persecuted it, the more it spread. It was like Pharaoh. He didn't like the Jews because they were getting too big for his empire. They started to persecute him, and what happened? They were popping out babies like a Peds dispenser. I mean, it, the population mushroomed. It burgeoned because they were persecuted. 
And in this case, because they're persecuted, the church keeps expanding. So we're going to take a quick look at, at some of these things so you guys can, uh, can see it. Um, so this is the first persecution under Nero in 67. Do you want to re read this one? Can you read it okay? Or? The first persecution of, of the church took place in the year 67 under Nero, the 16th floor of Rome. This monarch reigned for the space of five years with tolerable credit to himself, but then gave way to the greatest extravagancy of temper and to the most atrocious barbatures. Among the diabolical whims, he ordered that the city of Rome should be set on fire, which order was executed by his officers, guards, and servants. While the empirical city was in flames, he went up to the tower of Messinaeus mm -hmm. and played upon his harp, sung the song of the burning of Troy, and openly declared that he wished the ruin of all things before his death. Besides the noble pile called Cirrus, Many other palaces and houses were consumed. Several thousand perished in the flames, were smothered in smoke, or buried beneath the ruins. <laughs> so he did this, and he didn't care if he destroyed everything. And Nero was disgusting. He was married to several men, several women, and an ox, and a couple other animals. So he was just—he was just pretty vile. Um, and he blamed all this on the Jews um, to persecute them. So it was pretty unreal what happened to them. Um, the next slide, can I get you to read that one, Roger? Oh, you can close it. You can close it. I didn't know it was open. Sorry, go ahead, Roger. The first persecution under Nero, AD 67, respectful compliance. Conflagration. Conflagration continued nine days. And Nero, finding that his conduct was greatly blamed in a severe Asian cast, determined to lay the whole upon the Christians at once to excuse himself and have an opportunity of bloodying his. Site can you all hear him okay? The, is yours? Mine okay. quiet. All right, I'll turn mine around so maybe you can hear it better now. This was the occasion of the first persecution and the barbarities exercised on the Christians was such as even excited the commiseration of the Romans themselves. Nero even refined upon cruelty and contrived all manner of punishments for the Christians that the most infernal imagination could design. So you can basically surmise that Nero was a sadist and he loved to inflict pain and punishment on people. And he caused all those problems and blamed it on Christians and the Jews um, to get out from underneath it. And it didn't really end. Um, Robbie, can you read this one? Yes, I want to ask you a question. Then. Yep. Um, so these initial persecutions were against true Christians and apostate Christians collectively. Would you this say this is very early on? It's yeah. 64 so there's AD no to real church per se. Yet. Right. It's just mainstream Christians. Because I know in like the 300s you had the um, Aryan controversy. controversy yeah. yeah. Okay. But that happens right after this, believe it or not. That's in 325 AD. This okay. ends in 313. Okay. All right. So the first persecution under Nero, AD 67. In particular, he had he had some sewed up in the skins of wild beasts and then worried by dogs until they expired. And others dressed in shirts made stiff with wax, fixed to axle trees, and set on fire in his gardens in order to illuminate them. This persecution was general throughout the whole Roman Empire, but it rather increased than diminished the spirit of Christianity. Okay, so what they did was they would put them inside of skins to attract the wolves and then let the dogs or the wolves go after them. And that was the only protection they had was whatever the skin was on top of them. And then they just basically ate them. Um, in the second instance, he used Christians basically as lanterns. Um, putting them inside of these 
um, luminaries in his gardens. So he would make the stiff material covered with wax, which is highly flammable, with them inside of it, light the whole thing up, and they'd be like a wick. So he was he was just really evil. So to continue on. In the course of it, St. Paul and St. Peter were martyred. To their names may be added Erastus, Chamberlain of Corinth, Aristarchus, the Macedonian, and Trophimus, and an Ephesian, converted by St. Paul and fellow laborer with him. Joseph, commonly called Barsabas, and Ananias, Bishop of Damascus, each of the 70. So a lot of people lost their lives during this time um, because of what he did. So there's there's a countless number of people. So this is from Fox's Book of Martyrs. Again, if you want to look at it, it's an incredible um, story of how it all came about over time. Um, David or Nancy, would you like to read this slide? And then I'm going to ask Linda next. The second persecution under uh, Domitian. Domitian. The emperor of Domitian, who was naturally inclined to cruelty, first slew his brother and then raised the second persecution against the Christians. In his rage, he put to death some of the Roman senators, some through malice and others to confiscate their estates. He then commanded all the lineage of David be put to death. Among the numerous martyrs that suffered during his per this persecution was Simeon, Bishop of Jerusalem, who was crucified, and St. John, who was boiled in oil and afterward banished to Patmos. Fabia, the daughter of a Roman senator, was likewise banished to Pontus, and a law was made that no Christian once brought before the tribunal should be exempted from punishment without renouncing his religion. So the threat was really there now. I mean, the properties could be confiscated. They could be martyred and killed a lot like when Christ himself was killed. And then if that didn't work, they had to renounce their religion. So everywhere they were going, you were on the edge of non-existence in, in the Roman Empire. Um, you know, I called on. Oh, Linda. Are you good? Okay. The second persecution under Domitian, AD 81. A variety of fabricated tales were, during this reign, composed in order to injure the Christians. Such was the infatuation of the pagans that if famine, pestilence, or earthquakes afflicted any of the Ro Roman provinces, it was laid upon the Christians. And there were several that happened. The Justinian plague, the Antonine plague was before this. But there was another one towards the end of the empire that they did. They blamed everything that happened to them on the, on the Christians. Let's go ahead. These persecutions among the Christians increased the number of informers, and many, for the sake of gain, swore away the lives of the innocent. Another heart hardship was that when any Christians were brought before the magistrates, a test oath was proposed. Then, if they refused to take it, death was pronounced against them. And if they confessed themselves Christians, the sentence was the same. The following so that's what we call was, double that's what we call double indemnity. You can't get out of it. It doesn't matter which way you answer, you're going to die. Go ahead. The following were the most remarkable among the numerous martyrs who suffered during this persecution. Um, and these are the, the different plagues that happened around this time. Just the Antonine plague, the plague of Cyprian, Justinian. The Roman plague of 590, um, there were several others that happened after this period. Um, so I just wanted to show you a quick rundown of what they were. Um, so continue reading here. 
Um, Linda? The second persecution yeah. under Domitian AD 81. Dionys Dionysius, the Areopagite, was an Athenian by birth and educated in all the useful and ornamental literature of Greece. He then traveled to Egypt to study astronomy and made very particular observations on the great and supernatural eclipse, which happened at the time of our Savior's crucifixion. The sanctity of his conversation and the purity of his manners recommended him so strongly to the Christians in general that he was appointed bishop of Athens. But it doesn't end there. So they, they wound up taking care of him. Um, continue reading. Nicodemus, a benevolent Christian of some distinction, suffered at Rome during the rage of Domitian's persecution. Protasius and Gervasius were martyred at Milan. Timothy was the celebrated disciple of St. Paul and Bishop of Ephesus, where he zealously governed the church until AD 97. Okay, so this picture is um, of the one that happened in Milan um, of Protasius and Gervasius, sorry, Gervarius. Um, and it was pretty pretty awful the way that they went. You could you could read about it. So Walter, can you read the next one? Can they hear you from there? Or do I need to turn this around? They might I'll turn it around. The second persecution under Domitian, eighty eighty one. Timothy was a celebrated disciple of Saint Paul and Bishop of Ephesus, where he zealously governed the church until eighty ninety seven. At this period, as the pagans were about to celebrate a feast called the Pagian, uh, a meeting of procession severely recruited them from the biggest idolatry, which so exasperated the people, they fell upon him with and beat him in so careful a manner that he fired the losers two days later. Okay, so these are what are recorded in history. We know how a lot of the ways to confirm it, but these are some of the ways we know how the disciples and apostles died. So I'll go on to the next one. Can we read that one? Uh, Walter. Okay. The third persecution on the Trajan, 8108. Third verse, it's even gave a respite to the suffering of the Christians. But reigning only 13 months, the successor Trajan, in the 10th year of his reign, A.D. 108, began the third persecution against the Christians. While the persecution raged, Finney, uh, 2D, as heathen philosopher, wrote to the emperor in favor of the Christians. In his epistle, Trajan returned the incisive answer, the Christians ought not to be sought after, but when brought before the uh, magistrate, they should be punished. Trajan, however, soon after wrote to Jerusalem, he gave orders to his officials to exterminate the stock of David, in consequence of which all that could be found that race were put to death. And this is the painting of them coming out of Jerusalem um, under Roman attack, I guess. So um, the next slide. Did I read this one, Sure. Oh, whichever is easier. Yeah. Simparosa, a widow, and her seven sons were commanded by the emperor to sacrifice to the heathen deities. She was carried to the temple of Hercules, scourged and hung up for some time by the hair of her head. Then being taken down, a large stone was fastened to her neck, and she was thrown into the river, where she expired. With respect to the sons, they were fastened to seven posts, and being drawn up by pulleys, their limbs were dislocated. These tortures not affecting their resolution, they were martyred by stabbing, except Euthenius, the youngest, who was sawed asunder. Yeah, so I know these are a little grisly. I just want you to know what people went through <laughs> to, to keep their faith. We have luxury, opulence, compared to what these people went through. And I don't know about you guys, but I'm painted verse. <laughs> this would be very hard to make it all the way through. Um, and so this Christian era just suffered 
person who should have to read 10 different emperors, did whatever they could to eradicate the faith construct, and still it went everywhere. Uh, um, it hasn't read. David, you want It's short and sweet and to the point. Did you ask me, Joe? Yes, I did. Okay. Just I... read uh, starting from Focus, the Bishop of Pontus. Okay. Focus, Bishop of Pontus, refusing to sacrifice to Nephium was by the immediate order of Trajan, cast first into a hot lime kill and then thrown into a scalding bath till he expired. So what does this remind you of? Leah said, Shadrach, Meshach, and Amendigo. It's an exact correlation to it. Um, and here's the only etching we have of that event um, with the kiln being up front and then the boiling cauldron behind it. Um, and this is <coughs> Trajan in the middle. And I'm sure all of you have seen pictures of Neptune or as he's otherwise known, Poseidon, um, the god of the sea, which the Lord has shown up a hundred million times in a hundred million ways, and people still think that's something. So anyway, um, let's see. I'm not calling on. Help me out, guys. I'm, Amanda, you want to try this one? Yeah. Uh, Trajan likewise commanded the martyrdom of Ignatius, Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch. This holy man was the person whom, when an infant, Christ took into his arms and showed to his disciples as one that would be a pattern of humility and innocence. He received the gospel afterwards from St. John the Evangelist and was exceedingly zealous in his mission. He boldly vindicated the faith of Christ before the emperor, for which he was cast into prison and tormented in a most cruel manner. After being dreadfully scourged, he was compelled to hold fire in his hands, and at the same time, paper, papers clipped in oil were put to his sides and set on fire. His flesh was then torn with red-hot pincers, and at last he was dispatched by being torn to pieces by wild beasts. So I doubt he was in this good of a shape before the these animals got to him. I think it was sort of the last vestiges. But um, he would under underwent a lot of persecution as well. I don't know the credibility of him actually being the, the right age or whatever to go all the way back in history to probably saying these are children being my father's kingdom kind of thing. But it's an interesting piece from um, Fox and the Martyrs. Let's see. Leah, you want to read this one? Okay. Third persecution under Trajan, AD 108. Trajan being succeeded by Adrian, the latter continued his third persecution with as much severity as his predecessor. And all this time, Alexander, Bishop of Rome, with his two deacons, were martyred as were Quirinius and Herm Hermes with their families, Zena, a Roman nobleman, and about 10,000 other Christians. So I was giving you the highlights as well as big numbers of how many people were persecuted and what times. So <clears throat> even though these letters to the Ecclesias are really short, they're impactful. They have a lot um, that you can show in that, in that history time span of what happened. Um, I think we're almost at the end of this, and we can stop for this evening. I think we are. This is the last one. Um, in Mount Ararat, many were crucified, crowned with thorns, and spears run to their sides. Um, imitation of Christ's uh, passion. Uh, Eusychus, a brave and successful Roman commander, was by the emperor ordered to join an idolatrous sacrifice to celebrate some of his own victories. But his faith, being a Christian in his heart, was so much greater than the vanity that he nobly refused it. Enraged at the denial, the ungrateful emperor forgot his service of the skillful commander and ordered him and his whole family to be martyred. 
So this is that church that's at the bottom of Mount Ararat, and this is a depiction of <clears throat> um, Eustachus. Um, you want to read this one? <laughs> at the martyrdom of Bostonus and Jovita, brothers and citizens of Brescia, their torments were so many and their patience so great that Calcerus, a pagan, beholding them, was struck with admiration and exclaimed in a kind and exclaimed in a kind of ecstasy, Great is the God of the Christians for which he was apprehended and suffered a similar fate. So, I mean, even if you were to speak for them, you were, you were martyred. So um, we'll stop there for tonight and pick up next week. And um, Roger, would you close us? Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, God of Israel, we thank you so much uh, again to, to the things that we talked about tonight, to know of the brothers and sisters in Christ who suffered terrible things. We do not know what lays before us in our time. We pray that whatever we have to endure, whether physical or mental, that you will give us the strength uh, to, to deal with these things and that quickly we come. We pray that they don't, but we know that things can get worse very quickly um, if the situation continues as it is. But until then, we thank you for allowing us to come together, share in this hope, talk about our faith uh, so freely with one another, and to look forward to that wonderful day when your son will return and raise the brothers and sisters of the ages to stand again and to, to help you, your son Jesus, to run the kingdom of God that we look so um, much forward to. Be with us now as we go our separate ways and give us strength in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.